If you hear these two sounds, you just know that these are two different instruments. But how do you know this? Even though they're both playing the same A4 note at roughly the same volume, how do you describe what sets them apart? The answer is something called timbre. To better understand what that is, I created the Timbre Explorer, my final dissertation project for my Master's in Sound and Music Computing and the subject of this video. It's a synthesizer that can mimic a wide range of instruments through the control of just four continuous parameters. With a simplistic design, it also serves as an approachable introduction to the basics of sound synthesis. But through the Trojan Horse of Timbre, this project also has the potential to introduce even a casual audience to the frequency domain, an advanced and extremely useful analysis tool to a vast multitude of professions and academic disciplines. Before I can tell you how I can do all this, I should first answer... By its official definition, timbre is an attribute of sound, and it accounts for everything that's not loudness or pitch. So essentially, sounds are distinguished by these three main aspects. Pitch, loudness, and timbre. All of these are based on perception. They're in our heads, as opposed to being simple objective measurements. But that's not to say they can't be measured. Pitch, for example, is linked to the frequency of the sound wave. Loudness is linked to the sound wave's amplitude. If I want to measure the difference between two pitches, I can take the difference in their frequencies. For loudness, the difference in their amplitude. But for timbre, there is no such numerical attribute. Because of how timbre is defined as anything that's not loudness or pitch, it's impossible to account for all the other possible differences between two sound waves in a single unit of measurement. So to better define what timbre is, researchers have come up with this idea of a timbre space. Instead of a timbre being linked to a single numerical attribute, it's linked to multiple attributes. In a timbre space, each attribute is a dimension that the sound can vary along. Here, for example, we would have a three-dimensional space with three separate attributes, one for each dimension. This idea of a timbre space is central to this project. Imagine, if you will, if our previous example was a perfect timbre space. If it was, then I could describe the sound of any instrument in existence using just those three parameters. Not only that, but I could make a synthesizer that could mimic any instrument in existence, and instead of having its controls look like this, it could look like this. Now, based off the past 43 years of timbre studies, I decided to use a four-dimensional timbre space, meaning I actually have four parameters to control my synthesized sound. Spectrum, brightness, articulation, and envelope. Now let's take a look at how these parameters control the sound of the Timbre Explorer. The synthesis model is as straightforward as our number of parameters. Each dimensional parameter is its own module in the signal chain with the modules connected one after another. So let's go through them in order. The signal chain starts with the spectrum dimension. Perceptually, sounds that have a low spectrum value might be described as more hollow whereas raising the spectrum value makes the sound more full until it reaches a tone that you might describe as buzzy. In past timbre space studies, this dimension correlated to a term called spectral density. But functionally, the spectrum parameter controls the base wave shape, starting off as a sine shape wave, then to a square shape wave, and finally a sawtooth shape at the end. But what do these shapes have to do with spectral density? Well, here's a graph of the wave's frequency spectrum, which is where the dimension gets its name. If you don't know what a frequency spectrum is, you're certainly not alone in that. But today I want to try to show you what it is, rather than tell you. As you can see, the spectrum gets more and more dense as we progress from a sine, to a square, to a saw. I'm still playing the same C6 note, but something else about the sound changes. If you want a more technical description of what's going on, the sine shape wave starts with a pure fundamental frequency, and we slowly bring in the odd-numbered harmonics as we progress to the shape of a square wave. Then we finally fill the gaps between the odd harmonics with the even-numbered harmonics to transition to a fuller, sawtooth sound. In addition to this harmonic progression, as you may have noticed, there are some inharmonic cases at the extreme ends of the spectrum. Just to provide some other options. To understand how the signal chain works, you need to know that the frequency spectrum dictated by this parameter is the foundation of the Timbre Explorer's sound. Think of it as the raw material for a sculpture. Whether it's marble, wood, or even play-doh, the sculpture can be shaped into many different forms but will still be recognizable as its raw material. The rest of the signal chain consists of the other three dimensions shaping this raw spectrum to obtain the final spectrum as the end result. The first of these shaping effects is the brightness dimension. 
At low brightness values, the sound is, well, less bright. It's dull, muted. If I increase the brightness, the sound gets so bright, it gets too bright and starts to sound tinny. The brightness dimension correlates to a term called spectral centroid, which you can think of as the center of the sound's frequency spectrum. For the Tambor Explorer, brightness is implemented as a filter that effectively shifts the center of our raw spectrum. This graph shows the frequency response of the filter. To visualize the effect of this specific dimension, simply overlay this over our raw spectrum to obtain our final spectrum. Let me show you this in action. The center region of our brightness range is a neutral setting, and no effect is actually applied. Below the center region, the filter becomes what's called a low-pass filter, shifting the center of our spectrum towards lower frequencies and leading to a duller sound. Above the center region, the filter becomes what's called a high-pass filter, shifting the center towards higher frequencies and brightening the sound up to our tinny tone. In technical terms, what filters do is apply a modifier for different frequencies, leaving some frequencies unchanged, some frequencies quieter, and sometimes making some frequencies louder. The final two dimensions control how the sound changes over time, starting with articulation. In the center, we have neutral articulation, and the sound is unchanged. At low articulation values, we have, put scientifically, an increasingly pronounced boah kind of sound. At high articulation values, we have what I'm going to call a new kind of sound. Articulation correlates to spectral flux, which measures how much the frequency spectrum changes over time. Up to this point, our final spectrum has been the same from the start to the end of the note. But now, the articulation module changes how it evolves at the start of the sound. This is done using another filter which acts on a spectrum after it has been filtered by the brightness module. Unlike the brightness filter, this articulation filter has a change in cutoff frequency, with the cutoffs changed shown in this green graph. Once again, no effect is applied in the middle of the range. But below this neutral zone for the bois sound, the filter is a low pass filter with an increase in cutoff frequency. The sound starts with its low frequency content, and the higher frequencies are brought in later, as seen in the live final spectrum. Above the neutral zone, for the new type sound, the filter has the opposite behavior as a high pass filter with a decreasing cutoff frequency. Here, the sound starts with its high frequency content, and the low frequencies come in later. The last stage of the signal chain is the envelope module. At low envelope values, we have very percussive sounds with sudden onsets. Think drums, xylophones, cannons, you know, percussion. At high envelope values, we have much longer attack times for softer onsets, as you might hear in violins or other bowed string instruments. This dimension corresponds to what we call the attack time, the time it takes for the sound to reach the peak of its volume, starting from when it's first triggered. So, Low envelope values have short attack times. High envelope values have longer attack times. Behind the scenes, this module takes the form of an ADSR, which models notes amplitude over time as the attack time, the time to decay, down to a sustain level, and finally the time to release down to zero amplitude. When the envelope value is changed, it primarily affects the attack and the decay time. Though, below 40%, I've also forced the sustain level to zero to make for more impulsive sounds. Essentially, the envelope value decides how the volume of the whole sound changes. So, unlike our brightness and articulation filters, all parts of the frequency spectrum are multiplied by the exact same factor, which is dictated by the ADSR. And that's our signal chain and our dimensions explained, but what does the Tambor Explorer actually look like? Here's the prototype of the physical form of the Tambor Explorer. Most of it is just a commercial off-the-shelf MIDI keyboard used to trigger new notes. For those unfamiliar, MIDI means it's an input device that doesn't make its own sounds in the same way an Xbox controller doesn't run its own games. Above it, I've made an enclosure for the hardware I added. To control the four-dimensional parameters, I used two two-dimensional touch sensors instead of four sliders. If you'd like, you can still think of this as four sliders, where the horizontal position controls one dimension, and the vertical controls another. Under the hood, we have the brains of this project, a Bella microcontroller. Everything is connected to it, the MIDI controller, the touch sensors, and an aux cable for audio output. 
I chose the Bella because it's made specifically for real-time audio applications since it was important that users get instantaneous feedback when they change the timbre dimensions. It does so using a block-based processing, which I implemented in C++. I could go into even greater detail about the math and programming techniques I use to keep up with the standard 44,100 audio samples per second, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it out. Since I'm using touch sensors instead of touch screens, I also need the graphic user interface to display my last touch position of the sensors. This is why the bell is connected to a computer via USB where an in-browser JavaScript GUI is displayed. You can see our current position in our timbre space in the top left. When I use the touch sensors, the red dot moves to reflect the updated position, as do the numerical readouts at the top of the screen. I've also added a number of other features with the goal of enhancing the user experience. In the middle, we have what I call the informational block diagram, which you may recognize from our explanation of our timbre dimensions. As already demonstrated, this shows how dimensional modules are connected to the block diagram. Each block is a graph of relevant real-world information, which also provides real-time visual feedback. So putting this all together, we can make a lot of different kinds of sounds here. But let's try to ground this into something more familiar. Off to the right, I have a few preset settings I can recall in this drop-down menu. This, for example, is my best approximation of a piano. Pianos make sounds using hammered strings, which produce both even and odd harmonics, but with a slight inharmonic factor due to its percussive mechanics. This leads us to a relatively high spot in the spectrum range. Also, since it's percussive, the envelope value is low for a short attack time. Articulation is neutral, and brightness was subjectively moved to match the sound by ear. Returning to our two examples at the start of the video, here's a comparison with my flute preset. Other examples include a glockenspiel, a wooden xylophone, and a clarinet. Sometimes you need different pitch ranges for it to really work. The final feature for the Timbre Explorer is its hidden advanced controls. By default, these controls are hidden, but can be exposed using this button on the bottom right. The goal of this project is to be an approachable introduction to timbre and synthesis, but I did want to leave the option to progress to a greater degree of control over the synthesized sound. These controls allow the users to fully customize the ADSR, filter resonances for both articulation and brightness, and a four operator frequency modulation scheme. The different dimensions still have their own effects, and the signal chain remains the same. But the controls allow for changes outside this timbre space system. And that's the current prototype for the timbre explorer. Right, so... Let's recap what we've just been through. Timbre is an attribute that can distinguish sounds with the same loudness and the same pitch. We've broken it down into four component dimensions and uses a control synthesizer using four corresponding parameters. Now, you might think this is cool, and I certainly think this is cool. Why is it important to learn about timbre? Who but a specific intersection of musicians and cognitive scientists has anything to gain from this? Well, outside of understanding timbre, the Timbre Explorer provides a pretty decent introduction to the basics of sound synthesis and synthesizers. Filters and ADSRs are building blocks still used today to shape modern EDM sounds and realistic instrument recreations. And while I didn't talk about it as much, the advanced controls for the spectrum dimension provide a sandbox to experiment with FM and additive synthesis. But beyond music, what excites me most about the Timbre Explorer is its use in demonstrating the concept of the frequency domain. By default, most people are used to visualizing signals in the time domain, seeing how they change over time. But it would have been much more difficult for me to explain the spectrum and brightness dimensions if I was only using time domain graphs. It's a tricky concept to wrap your head around, it's a graph of frequency instead of time, and it effectively separates individual components of a single sequence of values. But with the Timbre Explorer, you benefit from both visual and auditory feedback to help your understanding. You're always hearing a single sound, but you can see how it objectively changes through the frequency domain graphs of the spectrum and the brightness dimensions. What's more, the frequency domain isn't only useful for musical signals. In communications, civil engineering, finance, even chemistry, the applications of the frequency domain in the real world are nearly endless. Frequency filters, the effect behind the brightness and articulation dimensions, are used in engineering just as much as they're used in synthesizers. This is what I find most interesting about timbre. It's potential to introduce people to advanced mathematics through the common language of music. Unfortunately, since we've built a physical prototype and there just happened to be a global pandemic, we weren't really able to test out the timbre explorer with actual users and get their feedback. 
This graduate program is over for me, but I hope to see a continuation of this project in both education and in furthering our understanding of timbre. Until then, if you're interested in making your own timbre explorer, I've included a link in the description to the GitHub page, which will also have hardware instructions. Everything in this project is made from commercially available parts with straightforward wiring. I've also been rolling around the idea of converting this into a web app, so maybe stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching. I sincerely hope you found it both interesting and informative. Whether you build one yourself or just watch this video, I'd like to hear what you thought of this project, such as things I could have explained better or suggestions for future improvements. If even one of you learned something about timbre, synthesizers, or the frequency domain, then I'd feel greatly accomplished. Until next time. My god, this is so difficult, dude. Alright.